In this video, we go over the specific criteria related to identifying a contract with a customer. This is step one in the five-step process of revenue recognition. There are five criteria to identify contracts. Number one, all parties agree to the contract and commit to performing. Number two, each party's rights are identifiable. Payment terms are identifiable. Four, the contract has commercial substance. And five, the collection of the consideration is probable. Now, there's a couple things you should notice about these five criteria. First, these are different from what you learned about in contract law. Second, there's nothing required to be written. Third, that commercial substance line is a little bit different and basically what it means is that there's something economically going on here. So it's defined officially as the risk timing or amount of the entity's future cash flows is expected to change as a result of the contract. So economically something is going on here. And the fifth one, notice that the collection of the actual transaction price is probable. So let's take a look at this and see how it's applied. We have an example um, of a manufacturer for designer cases for tablets, and they're trying to get into a new market. So they sold 5,000 units at a contract price, $75, but the retailer is struggling. After looking things over, it looks like even though they're financially not very stable, they're still likely, it's very probable, that they'll still get paid, but we may have to give them a 20% off. So, do we make the fifth criterion? Is it collection probable? The answer is yes. It is probable, but it's probable at the 80% of the full contract price. Therefore, the transaction price is the probable amount. We multiply the, the full contract amount, 375 times 80 percent, that's our transaction price. We don't worry about what's written in the contract, we worry about what's actual, it, what's probable. Now, what if you don't meet the five criteria, there's at least one missing? Well, we have specific ways of dealing with it. The big overview here is that you have to call it unearned revenue until these things have happened. There's no remaining obligations. There's no more consideration that's going to be exchanged between the parties. And the seller, um, there's no more, the transfer of control has happened. So, okay, let's see what this means in an example. We have a retail developer selling a building to a corporation. The contract price is $5 million and they're going to pay a 10% down payment and then they're going to do remaining installments over the next five years. The payments are non-refundable and if the other company defaults, SBA keeps the payments and it keeps the building. Okay, so the um, customer is intending to open a hotel. Unfortunately, they picked a not a good location. The company that's selling the building is aware that if the hotel's not profitable, they probably can't pay back. So on the day they enter the contract, they actually don't meet that probable criteria. They, they're not likely to see this happen, so they cannot call it revenue. But they go into this contract and they go ahead and start doing the exchanges. The first down payment comes in and then the quarterly payments come in. Let's see how they account for this. The first payment, the down payment, is considered unearned revenue. All remaining payments are considered unearned revenue. Then, on June 30th, they fail to make a payment. Now they're in default, and by the contract, they lose control over the building, and the contract is basically over now. So we take the unearned revenue to date, and we recognize it as revenue. It is possible that you could have more than one contract, but it's all connected. If you have contracts that are negotiated as a package and they're basically so intertwined, it's it's really just getting you one big thing, we're going to treat it as an in, um, one performance obligation. 